Hello, everybody. I'm proud, honored, humbled to be in the presence of a wonderful musician, Mr. Ralph Armstrong, bass player, aficionado of all music as far as I'm concerned. But let's just start here. Let's just do some name dropping, okay? Ralph. Yes, Dan. Have you worked with these people, Mahavishnu Orchestra? In the words of a great poet, certainly. <laughs> That's Jerome Horowitz, ah. Curly of the Three Studios. Yes. Yes. I'm a very jovial person, as you know. I know you are, <laughs> and, th and that's why we have you here. Yes, thank uh, you, sir. Because, thank you, old friend. Uh, you're able to put uh, humor into all of this very serious <laughs> business that you've done. Yes, I've been John McLaughlin. Yes. Uh, World Youth Symphony with Leonard Bernstein. Yes. Oh, my God. Beatles producer George Martin. Yes. Uh, Galen McKenna. McKinney. Yes. McKinney. Yes. Sorry. Yes, that's okay. Miles Davis. Yes. Herbie Hancock. Yes. That's something. Patrice Russian. Yes. Jean Luc Ponte. For 10 years, yes. Carlos Santana. Yes. Frank Zappa. Yes. Earl Clue. Yes. Don Sabetsky. Yes. A great, wonderful great arranger. Pro, yes, great yeah. producer with the London Symphony. With the London Symphony Orchestra, right. whom so you've also worked with the, Lon the LSO, mm -hmm. the London right. Symphony That's Orchestra. Right, that's right. Narada Michael Walden. One of my best friends on the earth, yes. Uh, Detroit's Keith Washington. Yes. And, of course, Aretha. For 30 years. Wow. I know you can go on and on with this. Yes, yes. I know you can. But it's amazing to me that somebody who uh, came out of Detroit, mm -hmm. uh, who, by the way, attended some of the same schools that I did uh, I, in I, the name of Cass Tech. I didn't know that. Well, no, honor, I wonder why you're such an intellectual. Well, <laughs> honors honors band for Cass Tech. I did not wow. do what you did. You went. You 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 were uh, a student at Cass Tech for yeah. forever. Well. Uh, during, yeah, they threw me out school. when they got tired of me. <laughs> well, I doubt that. Uh, but then, you know, you had uh, these wonderful experiences uh, that took you from Cast Tech. And by the way, while we're, while I'm I, I'm talking about Cast Tech, um, I don't know who the instructor was at the time for your band. I had Jack Shelby. He just passed two years ago. Yes, I know, because Jack Shelby mm -hmm. was my band teacher at Cody High School. Whoa, that's been way back. Wow. That's way back. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, we had Larry T uh, Larry Teal Jr. at Ca at uh, Cody, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But there were the Bijans and the Arnaldis and all these other yes, people. Yes, Harold right? Arnaldi. Yes. And uh, so we were... Uh, we were under the tutelage of some really good people, mm. right? Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Masters of music. Yeah. You know, intellectuals and disciplinarians. They insisted you do things the right way. And I don't know if you remember Emmanuel Cortez. Yes. He was from Budapest. Mm -hmm. And I had to see this man at 7 o'clock in the morning. And he would be cussing me out in Hungarian. You know nothing about the instrument. Your technique is terrible. Pay attention. What are you doing? The sound is trashy. It's trash. It's trash. You know, that's how he would talk, you know. Yeah, right, right. He was a great man, but he was he was a friend too. Yeah. He taught with compassion. So from those days mm -hmm. of Cast Tech uh, and your earlier days, when you started, uh, what, at, were seven years old when you started this uh, music business? Uh, of, I of playing started bass? playing at seven. Yeah. <clears throat> the reason why, I uh, saw my uncle, Lee Crockett, we call him L.C. Armstrong, mm -hmm. and my dad 
always wanted me to play the violin. I hated the violin because I never could get a sound out of it. It was squeaky. I played to a cry. Dad, I want to play the violin. Play the damn fiddle, boy. <laughs> and I hated it. So finally, <clears throat> I, it was a Sunday. I never forget it. We went to my uncle Lee Crockett's place, and he was a sharp dresser back in the early 60s. Guys were sharp. There were suits and ties every day. All right. You know, right. and I and I heard him play this golden K bass, this big violin. And I look, and he gave me strawberry ice cream and the sound of this rich <laughs> instrument, the tone deep. I told my dad, "Oh, daddy, I want to play like Uncle Elsie. I want to play like Uncle Elsie. I want to play the bass. I want to play the bass." And I almost pulled my father's pants down. But he was like, doggone it, dang nabbit boy, leave me alone. I'll get your doggone bass. <laughs> so the next year, my father actually made me a bass. It was a square. He made it out of old pine wood, and it had a round hole like an acoustic guitar. Right. And he put a, he put a bass bar in it. He was a luthier from Tennessee and put an old German neck. That neck he put on that bass had to be at least a couple hundred years old. We found somewhere. And that's how it got started. People are going to ask, okay, Ralph, mm -hmm. what what drove you uh, to this wonderful career that you've had? You know, you've met all these people, you've worked with all these people, but early in your life, uh, can you talk about your inspiration? What was the driving force for you to propel you to where you've where you've gotten? My mentor and teacher, who mentored me, was Ron Carter. Wow. When I heard Ron Carter at the age of 14 mm. live at a CTI concert at the old Ford Auditorium, and I was taken there by, this is something that nobody doesn't know. This is the first for your interview, mm -hmm. your network. All right. I was taken to this concert by Dr. Lonnie Smith, the great organist. Oh, my goodness. He took me. He introduced me to Ron Carter. And my teacher. Wait. wait why? How did that happen, though? Why Lonnie Smith? I, mean, I met Lonnie playing. He would come around. You know, the jam sessions in Detroit. I think I met Lonnie over at Baker's one night. And I came and sat in as a kid. You know, my mom would take me or Racy Biggs' father would drive oh, us. Sure. We were Racy kids. Biggs. Yeah, yeah, we were trumpet, kids, yeah. so he liked the way I played, and my teacher, Anderson White, who was also one of my conductors at Interlock and was friends with Ron Carter, so I listened to Ron play that night, and I was totally mesmerized with the tone, and he was playing the bass with a Barkus Berry pickup, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it was modern. You could hear it through the speakers and deep sound, and I, and I went up to him, and I played his bass because Andy was, he let me play his uh, uh, Jusak bass. Mm. And I was just a kid and he looked and smiled at me. Then when I got through playing, Jack DeJanette was there too. The oh great my. Drummer. Jack yeah. DeJanette, oh, yeah. Eric Gales, they were all laughing. <laughs> so my, Ron Carter looked at my teacher, Anderson White, who was a genius. He taught, he ended up retiring at Indiana State. Mm -hmm. Master classical uh, 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 instructor, concert uh, conductor. Ron looked at him and said, How dare you let him play the bass like that? His technique is horrible. You sent him to me. How do you let him do this? You know better than Andy. It was like, yeah. They're like, Andy White? I was like, Damn, he's talking to Andy White like that? So Ron called me, took my phone number. When he came to town, he would always call me and give me lessons. My mother would drop me off at his hotel, and he had me playing. The tetrachord, the eight-tone scale, he had me play it 1,492 times. Wow. But it was like this. It doesn't sound right. It's still not right yet. 
until this is something that young musicians really need to understand this. Yeah. Until I developed a musical tone, that's where it starts. And now at this age, I really understand what he was doing mm -hmm. with me as showing me how to get a sound. So if I play on any instrument, it's going to sound like me. Right. That's what people have a misconception when they talk about James Jamerson. I'll get to him later. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't understand it's about the sound. You could have this bass. It doesn't. I don't give a, a D A M what kind of bass it is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make it sound like myself because it comes from the body. And they would talk. Oh, it's the amplifier. That's a bunch of BS. It's mm -hmm. the sound you get from your fingers. So that's how you know. It's part started. of your personality, your right. DNA, whatever, right? right? Ex exactly. And today, I think the way our educational system is, musicians don't understand that. They want to think it's a gimmick. It's a cable. It's the strings. Oh, it's the labella strings. It's this. It's that. It's bunk. I use all kinds of strings. I still sound like myself. I use certain strings to have different effects. Right. But it's still going to make it sound like me. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So this goes on from that inspiration. And you uh, are now at Castech. Yeah, I'm teaching part time. Mm -hmm. And you're teaching. Yeah, you are teaching part time. But mm -hmm. but while that high school experience. And by the way, I needed to share something with you. When I was in mm -hmm. honors band at Cast Tech, and not that this is about me, but when I was there, the interesting thing was, and these were on Saturdays, just Saturdays. Uh, I wasn't like you. I did not have that <laughs> whole Cast Tech experience, oh, God. which was a beautiful school, and still yes, is. Yes, it is. It, it, and they it were still trying. Is, yeah. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when we had our breaks, everybody would go into the cor their corners, their individual corners, and they'd, they'd be a group of, of four or five singers. It could be bass players with saxophone players. Everybody was doing their own thing. You would think that, oh, well, let's go out for a coffee or a sandwich break or whatever, but they were continuing. So it was like so inspirational for me. Did you have those kinds of experiences? Cast? All the time. We were we tried to get better. And I tell you who I went to school with at Cass, one of the greatest piano players, actually two of them, that ever walked the face of earth. I went to school, and she always told me I gave her a first job, which is another story, Jerry Allen. No. The great Jerry no. Allen, bless right. his soul, my dear friend. Right. And also, his nickname at the time, he doesn't like it now, I don't call him that anymore, was Mouse. And that's Greg Fillingame, oh, who conducted a lot of Michael Jackson's, recorded all of that stuff, recorded with Quincy Jones, yeah. Herbie Hancock, he was there. And also another guy who was the head, he was like the, the main uh, person at cast out of all of the students, was Jay Jones. His name now is... Kamal Kenyatta, producer no. of Greg Reporter. Right. He was there and, um, oh, God, so many other Matt things. Michaels? Was Matt Michaels there or no? No, I, he's I don't before remember. me. Yes, but he did go to Cass. Yeah. And then our union president today, uh, George Troyer went there. George you know, Troyer. I can go on. Major Holly. You know, but you, work, you, you also work with uh, Kenny Burrell. Wasn't yes, Kenny, Kenny Burrell, Burrell. a, a yeah. Cass guy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I believe so, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And then you went from then cast that experience and moved on, mm -hmm. uh, and you come across all these people. And these are stories. These are all little nuggets that I have to tell you I'm so impressed by, that you were involved with uh, the Clues and the Miles Davis. And the, mm -hmm. well, how did, you know, for, how, for, do you get started? how do you get started doing all that stuff? It's... Divine inter intervention from God. I believe that you will on a path. Uh, it's Our lives are set when we're born. And if you have a love for something, if you do the right things, things will eventually work your way. And the reason I got out of Detroit, uh, I've said this, this is documented. Uh, my break, I... I I give him a lot of credit for it. And his name is James Jamerson. Mr. Great Motown. Motown basis. Motown. I never course. forget, he was playing 
he was sitting there with Aretha's sister, Carolyn Franklin, at the Mozambique nightclub. He had just left Marvin Gaye at the Olympia on Grand River in Detroit. And he came there and he had this leather suit on. That was the style back then. He comes in and he, and this is something I tell guys, they talk about, oh, the P bass, the, the bass, the bass. <laughs> I heard Jameson play that night on a Paul McCartney Hoffner Beetle bass. Wow. When a little bit, it looked like a little toy in his hands. Yeah, right. And it sounded like. He sounded like Jameson. Wow. Yeah. And he sat down with me, and he was drinking his uh, Metoxa, the, the Greek brandy. <laughs> right. And he looks at me, he say, I tell you something, you know, you little fat boy, you, you play good bass, but I got to tell you the secret to playing the bass and uh, it's the technique, because everybody wants to know how I can play the fretless bass. And I'm like, what the hell is a fretless <laughs> bass? So dig this. I look in a 1972, I know the exact year, because my bass, I just got my first precision bass. The bass I used with uh, John McLaughlin was Candy Apple Red Precision Fender. There was an illustration of a bass this color, sunburst, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it was fretless. Mm -hmm. And i never seen it. So what I did, I ordered the fretless neck, $70 back then. <laughs> and Otto Fortuna put it on my bass, and I started playing fretless. Because I could play the bass, you know, violin, so right. I started playing fretless. Right. So dig this. I was walking home. Well, actually, I was getting off the bus from Cass Tech, and I had my Czechoslovakian bass violin with me. And I stopped at Miles Davis' bass player's house, Michael Henderson. Right. Michael so Henderson. Michael says, man, I know these bad guys that need a bass player in Connecticut. And I played over the phone for Michael Nardo Walden and Sandy Tarano, wow. who's, uh, you might know Ru Sandy. Russ Russ Turan? No. Sandy. No, Sandy. Sandy. Who has a business. You know, he's in the jingle business, too. Yeah. So anyway, long story short, about a week later, I'm on uh, the airlines going to Canaan, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So I get to Canaan, and I'm playing with Sandy and Narda. We're playing with all this high-energy fusion music. I was just uh, 16. I just turned 16. Yeah. So uh, Narda kept saying, Maha Vishnu is coming. I said, what is Maha Vishnu? I thought it was a new Indian dish <laughs> that you eat. We getting Maha Vishnu for dinner or something? He said, no, <laughs> the great guitarist. And they were in the streets. Sri Chimoy, you know, the, the a spiritual right. religion, yes. you know, Indian. Yeah. So he comes up there, and I play. You know, I didn't know I was auditioning for a group or anything. Mm -hmm. He went ballistic over me playing a fretless bass. It just, I was like some piece of gold to him. I can't believe it, the sound. And on that same day, Jaco Pastorius was there. Because right. he auditioned too. I didn't realize there was an audition going on. Right. So he says, I'm going to call you. I want you to play bass. And I say, yeah, you're going to call this black kid from the east side to play bass. About <laughs> eight months later, never forget, it was a day almost like this. It was a little snowy. Mm -hmm. And I get this call. And it was John McLaughlin. He says, Ralph, somebody wants to talk to you. We want you to play bass. <laughs> I'm like, who is it? It was Carlos Santana. Oh, boy. I almost, I swear to God, I was like Don Knotts in the Ghost of Mr. Chicken. I was like, Carlos, he's like a guy. I mean, to me, Carlos, it's right. like, you kidding me? Yeah. So next thing I knew, uh, four weeks later, I got an airplane ticket, went to New York. I was working for Weiss and Maybach, Nathan Weiss, the mm -hmm. lawyer who brought the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Him and Sid Bernstein, Brian Epstein, they were responsible sure. for the Beatles. Yeah, sure. And two months after that, I was in London riding around in a Daimler limousine. Wow. The life of rock star, Rolls Royce and playing, working for Columbia Records. Were you pinching yourself or what? what was I didn't know what to do. Well, I was know, just blown was, the hell you didn't away. Know. <laughs> What was you happening, know, yeah. 
It, what a blessing, you know. Yeah, of, of course. And meeting yeah. and eating dinner with George Martin every night. And one thing I want people to know about George Martin and Michael Tilson Thomas and all those guys out of London, they treated me royally. I mean, it's like Jeff Beck would pick me up every night and ride me around to different spots and just Harvey Goldsmith, all of the big shot London guys. You but know. you're a guy from Detroit. Right. And east side. The east side of Detroit. And so was mm -hmm. there anything said about that at all? This guy's from Detroit. What does yeah, he what does he know? Kind of I mean, there's New York, there's stuff. LA, there's whatever. What, what was yeah. that all about? Yeah, and they call me Yank. You're a long way from home for Yank. Yeah, really? You know, yeah, the edge of the success over you. <laughs> <laughs> what what? You know, and uh, they were just nice people. Yeah. You know, British people are very nice people. They they have manners and mm -hmm. they have a great, um, uh, how can I say it, a love for culture. Did the Motown backdrop have any influence with any yes, of this? Yes, they loved that I could play that. As a matter of fact, I sound a lot like James Jameson yeah, at that time. I, I was playing that. real uh, bassy. I never could play... <laughs> I wasn't playing nothing like that. I was, you know, playing more basic. Right. Like, when I say basic, I meant bass violin concepts and approach to the instrument. So this is a fretless instrument. So yes, it's a public. Uh -huh. yeah. And so uh, your influence, though, from the fretless attitude comes from your ability to play... Uh, um, double bass, the, yeah. The double bass. That's right. So you switch from double bass to electric bass. When? Yes. When did that happen? You know, it's fun. I can tell you exact year. It's amazing. In 1967, I received my first electric bass. And you know what's funny about it? Hmm. It's the same doggone bass I'm playing today. It was a Framus Warwick from wow. Germany. No kidding. Guess what? My father got the bass from Zeeman's Pawn Shop. Oh, my gosh. I wish I had it because it's, it's it was a... Um, Oh God, the name of it, uh, a Starbase, mm. and it's in the catalog in the Warwick catalog. Yeah, yep, a Starbase. That's base. amazing. Yep, and this cream was cream. I wish I had it. I I wish I had it. They worth a lot of money. But the neck at the time, you know, everybody, oh, the Fender, 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 Fender. Yeah. So I traded it in on a Fender base. But bass, you're you're mm -hmm. behind the scenes. You're in the back of the lineup. You're not there out in front like a guitarist or a saxophone player. Well, you're, you're that behind. was back then, but not now. Not now, right? <laughs> not now. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but to that end, um, why in the beginning would you have gone off to the bass? Because that was... A different thing then, wasn't it? You're behind. To a certain You're... degree it was. But let me tell you something that's unusual about me. That, And this is a first for your network. No, I've never said this on any interview. Okay. Ever. Okay. I played the guitar. I didn't know that. Yes. And I incorporate, right now I'm using, for this year I'm going to be playing six string bass. I can play guitar concepts. Mm. And that's why I got into using distortion a lot of those john mclaughlin and john lupin i use a a distortion device okay and it sound like Jimi hendrix <laughs> there you go you know I have to say that uh, for me, uh, starting out, <clears throat> not that this is about me, but I will. Oh, say, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I will say that uh, the bass is uh, as a as a rhythm instrument. It's it's totally uh, significant in the lineup of what we do. But as a chording instrument, you can change the chord of almost any. Uh, uh, change. You can change the chord by the mm -hmm. bottom, by what you do in the bottom. And I don't know if people know that concept, uh, mm -hmm. or our listeners will, but well, it's know, not something we can cover later on, mm -hmm, maybe in yeah. another session. But here, you but. know, the bass is, is a religious instrument. 
How do you how do you figure that? Well, I'm t- it's 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 documented. It's true. Gregorian chants were written for the bass. Can you explain that? I, well, it's a vial. It goes back almost 400 years. You know, it's the original instrument of the Catholic Church. This instrument, even though it's wait a, a minute, little, wait a minute now. The bass is a, an original instrument. The bass vial is the original instrument of the Catholic Church. The the upright bass? The, the, it was the, called the, the, the Veloni. It, the, that's why it has a scroll, because it was made to pray with. This is a religious instrument. I did not know and that. And basses had six strings, and people always say, oh, you got too many strings. They, we've had six-string basses, seven-string basses going back into the 1400s, like Giovanni Pablo Magini, Brescia, 1660, wow. Italy, who was a pupil of Gaspari Desolo, Brescia, 1542. He died in 1609. This is He was a scientist. He made bases that were 10 feet tall. It, it would take, <laughs> you could pull it, and I'd be on the ladder playing. <laughs> yes. So it's an interesting bass. It's a spiritual instrument. La 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 la. They would pray. Amazing. Yeah, it's a fascinating instrument. It's fascinating. Going back to Domenico Dragonetti, the great uh, bassist who was actually the first musical star star i call him well if you want to call him a rock star he was born in venice 1763 he died in london in 1846 they called him darko the dragon Hmm. and he was so great he also played with uh beethoven ludwig von beethoven really and if he didn't do an encore they would trash the theater in venice or rome wherever he played at they would tear it up he was like a rock star. Mm. Darko. Wow. Yeah, he's fascinating. All you bass players research him. I I have to tell you, I am just so amazed by your, uh, well, what you have done in this city. Oh, thank you. But also your your <laughs> your, your historical knowledge about your instrument. And That's from coming to CAS, going to CAS. They made us become intellectuals instrument. So you can converse. A lot of my friends... Um, just like I, um, Joe Corrington, I just did a concert with him. He's one of the greatest classical bass players in the world. He's my friend. Mm-hmm. And we did a concert for Fedona University with one of my students, uh, Kieran Hanlon, mm-hmm. who's the head of the music department up there. And uh, we could converse. We're talking about Gaspari Dessolo and... And we're playing jazz. He's playing all of the lead parts with the bow, and I'm walking like Ron Carter. Wow. But we can communicate because of my knowledge of the instrument. Yeah. We're friends. And we, you know, it's an honor to be a friend of one of the greatest classical musicians in the world. He was hit principal of the London Symphony for over 10 years. Wow. Joel Quarrington. He's a great master. Speaking of London, you've been all over the world. I know you have. Yes, uh, isn't that something? Yeah. It's pretty I cool. I feel it too. Yeah, <laughs> <All the airplanes. laughs> yeah, yeah but but uh, you can you tell us about some of those? Well, well all right. Let me ask what you. What do you this. want to ask me? Go ahead. Uh, what, what's the most uh, interesting? Can you say? I know that you've had a lot of it, a lot of interesting experiences, but what's is there any standouts for you uh, in terms of uh, your being involved overseas uh, in meeting all these? Wonderful other musicians, I mean, uh, whether it or, or domestically, for that matter. Uh, I've met a, a, a Eleanor Pegue. He was another great. I'm going to classical realm. He's a great classical bass player from Budapest. But I've met so many great jazz musicians over the years, and like um, Bob Cranshaw, Cranshaw, excuse me, mm-hmm. and um, one of my mentors, Buster Williams, who him and Ron, you know, they. <clears throat> Nurtured me Ron as Carter, a kid. yeah, yeah. The two of them really did, and yeah. one of the one of the most famous musicians that took time with me 
and I, I think he was so wonderful as a human being, was Ray Brown. Oh, wow. He spent a lot of time with me. Really? Yes, he did. He was a wonderful human being from, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Ray Brown. Oh, great. His but work with, funny, uh, with, with Oscar Peterson. Oh, my God. Uh, and I just, learned. I never will forget. I was working for Gibson Guitars, and I walk into McCormick Place, mm -hmm. and I heard somebody. I met Ray when, I, when he was Quincy Jones' manager. Ray was? Oh, yeah. Ray's a businessman. Business, you know. I didn't he, those know. guys, him and Bernard Purdy got me into the business realm of music. Mm. They, you know, they you got to be a business person. So, Ray Brown, <laughs> I was walking into a corporate place in Chicago, and I heard somebody, what the hell wrong with you, man? You can't speak? <laughs> I almost had a heart attack. It's Ray Brown sitting on his amp. I'm like, oh, God. It's, it's like seeing Jesus. You know, Ray. And we hung out, you know. And he's such a beautiful guy. And he was instrumental in developing the electronic transducer pickup for the bass. Ray Brown and Tommy Gamina mm. invented the polytone pickup. Wow. You know, he was instrumental in that. But you, you asked me about travels. I'm going to tell you this funny, it's funny, it's a funny story. And this is one of the great things about traveling. You're going to meet people that you never thought you would ever see or ever hear of. Istanbul, Turkey, about six years ago, I was with James Card, and we played Istanbul, Istanbul, Istanbul. I need some water now. It's a beautiful city, Istanbul, Turkey. I've been there, yeah, I know. And yeah. mm -hmm. we finished the concert. So they have a buffet out mm -hmm. and all of this great food. And this funny little character kept following me around. I just like the way you play the bass, you know. <laughs> I just like the way you play the bass. <laughs> I'm like, well, thank you. And he wouldn't leave me alone. He's kind of like being a damn pest. You know, kept pulling on me. <laughs> I want to tell you about me. You know who I am? I say, I know where you're going if you don't leave me the hell alone. You know, kept putting my hand. And finally, okay, I get by the chicken wings. So, <laughs> in Istanbul, they got great chicken wings. Okay. So, this guy kept messing with me. And he says, I want to let you know that I'm royalty. I said, look, I don't drink Crown Royal. You know, I'm, I'm yeah, messing right. with yeah, him. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, liquor. Yeah, yeah. For yeah. those who don't know, it's whiskey. Right. So, he kept, I'm royalty. And I am the 12th generation. I say you with the fifth dimension. <laughs> just say, you know, he's a pain in the, excuse me, we're pain in the ass. <laughs> That's all right. We're good. And finally, I just want to let you know that I am the seventh generation of Dracula. Wow. This cat came up to me and told me he was Dracula. Really? We checked him out, and his name is Hans Constantine. He does the Transylvanian Jazz Festival. He is related to Vlad the Imperla. He's Dracula's wife's blood. He's, he's related to him. No kidding. And let me tell you something. You should have seen all these big black dudes talking about, man, I ain't going to Transylvania. I ain't going to Transylvania. <laughs> Kenny Garrett, he went. We ain't seen him in a while. <laughs> Oh my God! Well, it was so funny. So we get to Paris. After that, we go to Paris, and James Carter was mad as hell. I said, "What's wrong, man? I saw your boy, man." I said, "Who? Dracula? <laughs> He's trying to get all these musicians to go over there." But that's one of the great things about traveling. You never dreamed you would meet somebody that was related to Dracula. And also, case in point, the Turks are the ones who beheaded Dracula in Turkey. So he was, you know, I, uh, it so all goes. Are we, we're talking about mythical stuff? Or are we talking about real stuff? Real was, and this factual. Is real stuff? Factual. They beheaded him and put, because see, Vlad and Perla would cut their, I'm a history buff, he would cut Turkish heads off and put them on stakes in front of his castle. Well, so that I, would scare I, I you from to, coming. I just have to interrupt and say as, an, as an Armenian, uh, yeah, we've had that. we've had a little I'm, bit of a yeah. problem with that. Yeah, uh, so sorry about that. I won't say anything more because we don't want to get into another. Yeah, subject. but yeah, but yeah. it's some you know <laughs> yeah. some <laughs> sick stuff. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. You know, 
I gotta say, going from Dracula though to Cast Tech <laughs> to a seven-year-old kid who's just taking bass lessons or yeah. whatever, this is quite a trip, man. I know. That's why I'm glad you you have me here, Dan. I thank you for having me because you know it's good to have things documented in your life. Yeah. You know, and these these things really happen, and I've been so blessed. To live the life I've lived, you yeah. know. I, I I should mention, too, that uh, as as a great, wonderful bass player, you have also a great, wonderful voice. Can you sing some blues going out here with your uh, accompanying? Hold it. Yourself? Okay. <laughs> I'm here. sorry to do this to you. No, but that's cool because I have a song that I wrote. Yeah. And it's viral. It's still selling. And I own all of it. On all the publishing, all good the for you. Rights. That's always good. And the song is called Blue Mashed Potatoes. Hmm. In, in Detroit, Michigan. She likes to cook me dinner at night. She likes to kiss and fight. Yeah, she does. But when I eat her food, you know. She starts to look all right. <laughs> oh, baby. Oh, baby. Please tell me why the mashed potatoes are blue. The more I eat, baby, the more I eat, pretty baby. I love you. The more I eat, the more I eat. I just love you. Blue mashed potatoes on Amazon and iTunes. Wow. <laughs> That's great. That's great. On Amazon and iTunes. Yes, that's, thank you very much. That, that's great. Support your local musicians. Support your international musicians. Yeah. Support all musicians. The great Ralph Armstrong. I couldn't be more pleased and honored to have you here with us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ralph. Thank you, and keep up the good work, Dan. We love you. Thank you. <laughs>